Andrew, thank you very much, and um, <clears throat> welcome to you all. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to stand here and see so many people here tonight, friends, colleagues, family, and people who've helped and supported me throughout my career. And it's been an interesting career. I'm firmly convinced that chemical engineering is an excellent profession, and it is truly an honor and a pleasure to be able to address you tonight as the 73rd president of the Institution of Chemical Engineers. To those of you who are members of the institution, I promise to do my very best during this next year to serve you as your president. I've long believed that this is a great profession, and given the chance, I'm quite sure that I would not hesitate to follow the same path again if I were making the choice today. That said though, my reasons for the decision today would be somewhat different from what they were when I first made the decision. Because, and let's be quite frank about this, back in the 1970s when I was making my first decision, I was looked upon as something of an oddball to say the least. I can well remember the words of my headmistress at school, who upon hearing of my intended career path, remarked, chemical engineering? Girls don't do that, do they? And at the time, she was mostly correct. The 1972 intake to Imperial College numbered some 75 undergraduates. All bar five were male, and practically everyone I met on my first day asked the same question. What makes a woman want to do chemical engineering? Well, I married one of the people who asked that question on the first day. But for me, the answer was simply that I wanted to become a teacher, and I strongly believed that the good science or maths teacher you needed to be able to be, you needed to be able to provide the context to what you were teaching, and that it would be good for me, if I was going to be a good teacher, to spend time, a couple of years maybe, in industry, after university, before becoming a teacher. That was the picture of the class of 72 that you were supposed to see when I referred to them earlier. But anyway, <clears throat> so my plan was to become a teacher, and I thought going into industry would help me enormously. But 1972 was something of a challenging climate for an aspiring female chemical engineer. If you look back, it sometimes felt as if I was trapped in an episode of Life on Mars with Gene Hunt running the show. And when I watch that program, it does remind me of some of the cultural issues we faced back then. Women were only allowed in the Union Bar at Imperial College on Sunday nights. <laughs> and only then if the fire was lit. Freshers Week included a gathering where the girls were paraded in front of the boys for one of us to be selected as Bo Bell. If you were lucky enough to win that competition, you were rewarded with the opportunity to look suitably decorative, sitting in the 1902 James and Brown automobile on the annual London to Brighton veteran car run. And to be honest, things weren't much better in the wider world of chemical engineering either, as this delightful advert from the chemical engineer of those days reveals. So we have moved on, I'm glad to say. And the undergraduate population here in the UK and around the world now better reflects the diversity of the world at large. There's still a long way to go before what some might describe as equality is fully realized. But I am happy to report that in comparison with engineering as a whole, chemical engineering is in a very good place. To begin with, the undergraduate population today is very much bigger 
than it was in the 1970s. Many of you will be aware that the discipline hit something of a crisis back in the 1990s. And applications to study chemical engineering in the UK actually suffered a dramatic slump. By the turn of the millennium, the total annual intake had fallen below 1,000, raising serious concerns as to the viability of many chemeng departments around the country. Quality was an issue as well, with many potential students failing to make the benchmark A-level grades required for an accredited degree program. Fortunately, ICHEM-E's leadership at that time had seen the challenge looming, and Council had already initiated a response in the form of highly targeted careers campaign, which many of us now know today as Why Not Chemenge. The program actually began in earnest in 2001, and it set out to portray chemical engineering in a totally new light. Out went the focus on pumps and pipes and serious looking gents in hard hats gazing at distillation columns, and in came a brighter and more useful suite of promotional materials. They focused on the diversity of chemical engineering career outcomes and the benefits that chemical engineers deliver. It provided controversial at the time. It proved controversial at the time. Indeed, in some quarters, there are still those who decline why not chemeng. But nonetheless, the proof of the pudding is very much in the eating. It does work. It does deliver. Last year, more than 2,200 students started on chemical engineering degree programs in the UK. That's an increase of 134% over the last decade. Applications to study ChemEng have tripled. It's true that this growth has come about during what we've witnessed in terms of considerable expansion in higher education all round, but the chemical engineering intake has grown at more than three times the average, and we've outperformed all of the other mainstream engineering disciplines by a considerable margin. ICHEMI's research reveals that this success story can be attributed to a very large extent to the Why Not Chemeng effect. Something else has changed since the 1970s. Chemical engineering has had the highest proportion of female applicants accepted in every year of the last decade. For each of those 10 years, at least a quarter of all accepted applicants to chemical engineering have been female. There's still progress to be made, of course, but I would like to think that if my old headmistress, or rather head teacher, as we must call her these days, were here today, then she might say to a Judith in this decade, Chemical engineering, what a good choice, Judith. And long may that continue. Indeed, Why Not Chemeng does continue in the UK and further afield now. ICHEMI is constantly on the lookout for opportunities to deploy a similar campaign approach in all parts of the world where the graduate pipeline gives rise to concern. It may be time to move the focus from getting people onto chemical engineering to persuading more of them to stick with the profession beyond graduation. Because being a young chemical engineer today offers tremendous opportunity. They're unlikely to be unemployed for very long, and whilst we shouldn't be too concerned if some choose to work in very different fields from the moment they graduate, we do need more engineers and graduates to stay with the profession, going into industry and staying in academia. It's essential, though, that we have people with a solid grounding in systems thinking, pursuing careers in the city, in consultancy, in finance, and in teaching. The skill set is eminently transferable, and if it all goes horribly wrong, don't worry, you're still a chemical engineer and we'll welcome you back into the profession and into industry. 
So I've made the assertion that we should be encouraging people to become chemical engineers. But why should we be persuading young people to study chemical engineering and to enter careers in industries that depend on chemical processes? Well, as I said, the reasons today are somewhat different. Population projections suggest that by the year 2050, the human population will grow from the current 7 billion to 9 billion. That's a 30% increase on our already overloaded ecosystem. For 9 billion people to stay alive, they will need access to clean water, to affordable food, housing, clothing, transport, healthcare, and energy supplies. And we must also respond to the growing challenge of climate change. And even if the population to were to remain static over the next 40 years, achieving the sort of reductions in global emissions that are thought necessary to prevent climate change, or indeed to cope with what's already happening, would be a challenge in itself. However, with 30% more people demanding goods and services, even more greenhouse gas emissions, the challenge is even more demanding. And one thing I'm sure about is that chemical engineering is a vital part of the jigsaw that is the quest for sustainable living in the 21st century and beyond. Engineering has been the catalyst to industrialization that increased the efficiency of production and access to all sorts of goods and services. I'm confident that we can make the technological leaps required in the future because we've shown we can do it in the past. This is an argument that isn't just mine to make. It's very clearly set out in iChemE's latest review of technical strategy and positioning, which we've called Chemical Engineering Matters. And I cannot emphasize enough the importance of this document. Chemical Engineering Matters is a driver for everything that iChemE is doing, and it will be the backbone of our future activities. It's a rallying point, and it is a powerful vehicle for engagement, both within the institution's membership and externally. The document makes it abundantly clear that chemical engineers have a pivotal role to play in creating, maintaining, and improving quality of life in the developed and developing worlds alike. The challenges are well rehearsed. Energy, food and nutrition, water, health, and well-being. But chemical engineering matters also demands that several other key issues are taken into account. These include safety and sustainability, as well as the need to collaborate with others. Education, training, and research needs, needs should also be addressed. Chemical Engineering Matters clearly identifies the essential role of the funda fundamental aspects of chemical engineering science and the systems thinking upon which our discipline is founded. It also calls upon engineers to capitalize on the opportunities presented by advances in biotechnology. Chemical Engineering Matters is important because it sets the agenda for our profession, for iChemE, and therefore for the membership for the next five to 10 years. But a key consideration must be how exactly are we going to turn this statement of intent, which we have laid out in Chemical Engineering Matters, into a reality. I know and I'm confident that we already have a wonderful story to tell. I know that there is already some fantastic innovation going on right across the chemical engineering community, in industry, and in academia. And I also know that we are continually making a difference. But I'm already worried 
about the silo mentality. Here we all are, heads down, getting on with the job, generally doing great stuff. But we're also failing to recognize the bigger picture, missing out on the opportunities to make the right connections, and in so doing, failing to unleash the full potential that exists within our profession, and clearly and unambiguously demonstrating that chemical engineering really does matter. And so, over the course of my presidential term, my plan is to work with my council colleagues, with our international boards, and with the staff of iChemE to really bring chemical engineering matters to life. We'll do this by reaching out and engaging with three key constituencies in particular. First and foremost, iChemE is all about its members because it's us, the members, who shape the delivery of the strategy through what we do in our own jobs, but also in our interactions with one another. In ICME's special interest and regional groups, and in our interactions with governments, through research and development, and in many other ways. It is the member, perhaps more so than anyone else, who fully recognizes that chemical engineering matters. They do it every day, and iChemE wants to engage with its members to bring the vistas in that document, Chemical Engineering Matters, to life. What we want to do is for your institution to help all of you tell your story and share your experiences and your achievements with iChemE so that we can build a compelling case to project the value of the work that you are all doing all of the time. Second, ICME is also about leadership and being no doubt that Council owns and will lead on the implementation of chemical engineering matters. But that leadership will be cascaded outwards to the international boards, to regional member groups, and to our special interest groups. And with leadership comes responsibility. Responsibility for delivery is going to be cascaded too. That's why I've sent a signed copy of this address to every board and group chair, asking them to share with me their personal ambitions and their ideas for making ChemEng Matters a reality the overarching principles and concepts that are set out in the document can and should be modified and adopted to make it real and make it appropriate for local delivery. And our third constituency is also important because we must never lose sight of the fact that, I, uh, that ICME and we as chemical engineers do not exist in a silo or a vacuum. We need to use chemical engineering matters as a vehicle with which we engage employers, educators, the research community, and with kindred organizations across the STEM landscape in order to find common cause. Quite clearly, we can't save the world and do it all on our own, but I would argue that the world can't do it without us. We have a unique and a vital contribution to make. Our traditional strengths form a very firm foundation, the breadth of the discipline, and the ability it gives us all to interact and work with many other professions. ChemEng Matters offers the potential for us to create some very, very powerful coalitions. So from now on, I'm going to take it as red that you all share my enthusiasm for this agenda, or if not, I hope you very soon will do. But I also have to tell you that this won't be without its difficulties. And I've already spotted a few obstacles to, process, to progress, and these will inevitably require us to do some careful thinking and some navigation as we take it forward. 
two issues that require addressing by this institution and by the wider chemical and process engineering community. The fundamental problem that some of you have heard me talk about before seems to be that we're not terribly good at learning from past failure and even sometimes from past success. And there's a related difficulty in that even when we do learn, we seem to be pretty inefficient at passing on that knowledge to our peers and to future generations. I've observed these phenomena repeatedly over the last 40 years of my career, not least during my last five years as chair of the Health and Safety Executive where my pronouncements about the failure of industry to learn from previous mistakes are, as I've said, well known and previously heard by many of you here tonight. But I worry that the problem is likely to become even more acute as a result of both ICME's age demographic and the pattern that prevails across much of industry as a result of that slump in numbers, which I referred to earlier, of people applying to become chemical engineers, which occurred in the late 80s and 90s. The situation looks even worse if we look at the institution's activist base, by which I mean those volunteers who organize things, turn up, and make things happen. In other words, the lifeblood of the institution. And this impending challenge can be seen across the whole of industry. The next slide is an example from Southeast Asia. Last month, I had the pleasure of sharing a platform with Petronas Downstream CEO, Datuk Wan Zulkifi, and he was speaking about the process safety situation within his own organization. And this one particular slide in his presentation caught my eye. We've all heard of Petronas. It's a young company. It has an average age of 34 in its employees. But what you will notice here are the twin peaks in this histogram showing the age distribution of the workforce. Very visible in the 25 to 29 age range and in the 55 plus age range. And the implications of this are pretty clear. Over the next 10 years, a lot of knowledge and a lot of corporate memory is going to walk straight out of the door with a gold watch or whatever the equivalent is customary given in Malaysia, unless Petronas puts in place a real plan to retain that knowledge. Because knowledge transfer is crucial to the success of the Chemical Engineering Matters Initiative. And the institution will approach this from three different perspectives. First, as we've already shown, we face a generational challenge. ICME intends to work to secure effective knowledge transfer between those twin peaks, which are evident not only in our own organization, and, but in companies who we engage with, like Petronas. This is not as easy as it sounds, of course. We can't just tell members what to do. We can't just deliver it in the old ways. Times have changed, circumstances are different, and the challenges which face young chemical engineers today are not the same as the challenges that our generation faced. This means that our accumulated knowledge before it's transferred must be distilled before we can pass it on to others. And as I've said, we have to find new ways of passing it on when we've decided what those messages are. Efforts have to be made to capitalize on modern communication and on social networking tools. The next generation may well want our knowledge, but that doesn't mean that they're prepared to go to our face-to-face -face meetings to get it, especially if we're still running our meetings in a way that makes them feel unwelcome are not encouraged to contribute because they're in the learning phase rather than the knowing it phase. 
regional knowledge gaps are also going to require bridging. I don't need to remind you that the process industries have gone global. And much of the traditional downstream chemical processing is now taking place outside the OECD economies. Increasingly, we find upstream exploration and production is taking place in more exotic, far-flung and difficult locations as the quest for hydrocarbons intensifies. And downstream industries increasingly locate closer to the growing market economies and where construction costs and labor costs are lower. So the second question is how do we secure effective knowledge transfer from the developed to the developing world? How can we help to prevent tragedies like last month's building collapse in Dakar? The death toll, as you know, has passed a thousand people. And whilst this wasn't a process safety event in the traditional sense of the word, as we would understand it, it does provide a compelling illustration of what can happen when a manufacturing operation is transferred to the other side of the world. The shirts made in that factory were once made in Leicester. They're probably still being worn in Leicester. These are developed world supply chains. This is a developed world problem. It's our problem. And that's a good thing, not a bad thing, because we have the solutions, but we have to pass them on. The third knowledge gap that we must confront is the gulf between technologies and sectors. Much of our process safety knowledge, particularly that which relates to asset integrity and to secure containment, has been accumulated in the high hazard industries, particularly oil and petrochemicals. We know a lot about risk management in the context of flammable materials, high pressure vessels, oxidizing agents and the like. But I would contend that we can add value, we can prevent loss, and save lives through effective transfer of that knowledge to new areas as well as those traditional ones. The new generation nuclear industry, carbon capture and storage and biofuels are obvious examples. Perhaps less obvious is taking knowledge of offshore operation in the oil and gas sector and passing on those parts that are relevant to those who will manage and operate offshore wind farms. And secure containment is of paramount importance when it comes to toxic pharmaceutical ingredients, biohazardous agents, and potentially disruptive nanomaterials. Chemical engineers are supremely well placed to ask the right questions, to ensure that risks are identified and addressed during the design and development phase of any process operation. Inherent safety, to use Trevor Kletz's phrase, is a primary consideration in every modern process design. Techniques such as HAZOP, HAZID, and LOPA are well understood by the professional chemical engineer, and building confidence in these risk reduction methodologies is central to iChemie's training of I will be working with Council to secure progress in all three of these areas, but as I said, we can't do it alone. Knowledge transfer can't be left to the staff in Rugby, Melbourne and Kuala Lumpur. Again, it's the members who hold the knowledge and it's the members who will ultimately transfer it. So member engagement is absolutely critical and I want to see iChemie getting much better scrutinizing the institution's work programs to see if they pass two very simple tests. Does the activity or the project or the initiative actually serve to improve member engagement in this organization? And will it bring about more effective knowledge transfer in one or more of the areas that I've just outlined? Because member engagement and knowledge transfer have to be integral to iChemie's approach to all of its work. 
So, why me? Why did you get me as president for the next year? Why am I standing here before you tonight calling on all of you to help me, to help the institution, and to help make the world a better place? Maybe I should have ended up in a classroom after all, but something happened that made me change my mind. Because when I found myself in industry, I couldn't leave because I enjoyed it so much. I have had a great career. But whilst I was still at Imperial, I received my first lesson in process safety and indeed in knowledge transfer. Again, a number of you have heard me say this before, but Flixworth had a dramatic, dramatic effect on me and probably on every single individual who had a connection with the British chemical industry at that time. But nowhere near as dramatic an effect as it had on the wives and the children, the mothers and the fathers and the loved ones of those 28 people who never returned home in June 1974. The explosion that ripped through the plant just before five o'clock changed their lives forever. But what did it mean for me? Well, after graduating, I joined SO Chemicals at Fawley as a process engineer. I was given my first production process to run after two years. I was manufacturing butadiene. I know I, I, it, it has a different name now, but it's what we called it then. And managing the storage of in excess of 10,000 tons of various C4 strips. So after two years in the industry, I was managing a top tier coma facility. During my 15 years with ESSO, latterly Exxon, I worked in several different business groups, always in manufacturing and always not just involved, but totally committed to health and safety matters. I had no difficulty at all buying into the company philosophy that all incidents and accidents are preventable. I then moved on to work for a specialty chemical company Elementis, also in operations, and subsequently became their group risk manager, working to spread health and safety culture into businesses as diverse as inorganic chemicals, animal feed, flour mills, timber and building supplies. And then in 1998, I joined the Chemical Industries Association, where I subsequently became its director general in 2002. And it was at that time that I also became a health and safety commissioner. I then subsequently became chair of the health and safety executive in 2007 and have been reappointed now to serve until September 2015. I readily appreciate that in most cases we create our own luck, but I really do consider myself to have been rather fortunate if not lucky. I've been properly trained by some very good companies. I've benefited from the professional development framework that is part and parcel of becoming a chemical engineer and a chartered engineer at that. I've learned lessons from my previous experience and from my exposure to wider events in industry. Industries that are often beyond my own sphere of direct involvement. But in many ways, I'm no different from anyone else. I'm a living, breathing body of knowledge. I'm the sum of all of my experiences and the lessons I've learned. But I won't last forever. None of us will last forever. And this prompts quite a difficult question. And that is, do we really want the next generation to have to learn our lessons all over again? from scratch, learning the hard way, with all of the catastrophic consequences that are recorded in the annals of the process industries. I, for one, do not want that to be the way it goes. That's why I remain involved with ICME, and that's why I'm standing here tonight, because it's not about luck. It's about learning, and it's about taking responsibility for ensuring that things move in the right direction, not just in process safety, but in energy and resource efficiency, environmental protection, 
materials, conservation, and all of the issues addressed within chemical engineering matters, including the effort that we have to put into communicating with policymakers and the wider public. So why is this such a big concern for me? Why do I raise such a serious issue with you tonight? Well, not least because it's very timely. An underline in my concerns is this month's copy of the Chemical Engineering magazine, which I'm sure some of you have seen, and which was described to me by the editor as the saddest issue of TCE that had been put together for many years. Catastrophic incidents involving fatalities and serious injuries coupled with consequential loss and adverse environmental impacts are described not once but on several pages in the latest issue. This is the 21st century, but we are still seeing the same things going wrong. And one of the incidents that was reported in the latest issue illustrates this point particularly well. Ammonium nitrate has been in common use for many years, both as a fertilizer and, of course, as an explosive. It's generally marketed as small white spheres or granules and appears pretty harmless, although it's an irritant and harmful if swallowed. Nonetheless, its explosive properties arise out of the fact that it's also a strong oxidizing agent and it will decompose explosively if it's subjected to heat, shock, confinement, and in some instances, contamination. Criminals and terrorists have known this for a long time, which is why the chemical industry puts careful measures in place to ensure that the product is only sold to bona fide people. Yet it is still widely available all over the world, especially, of course, at its point of use in farming areas. And anyone with a broad knowledge of the incidents that have come to define process safety over the years can be in no doubt as to the violent potential of ammonium nitrate. Back in September 1921, two violent explosions rocked a BASF plant at Oppau in Germany. The blast destroyed the plant and approximately 700 houses nearby. 430 people were killed. The cause was attributed to the use of blasting powder to break up piles of a 50-50 mixture of ammonium sulfate and ammonium nitrate. Records show that the workforce had carried out this operation many times before without incident. But on that fateful day, over 4,000 tons of what they thought was a simple inorganic chemical detonated, creating a crater 75 meters wide and 15 meters deep. So that was 1921. Now let's jump forward to a place called Texas City. And I'm not going where you think I'm going because it's not 2005. It's only 1947. And a freighter, the SS Grand Camp, was docked in the port. As well as carrying out a variety of, as well as carrying a variety of combustible materials, including cotton and peanuts, the cargo also comprised a quantity of small arms ammunition and over 2,000 tons of ammonium nitrate. A fire started, possibly due to a discarded cigarette, but attempts to extinguish the fire failed. A red glow persisting after a successive dousing with water and then with steam. A crowd of spectators gathered along the shoreline and watched the water around the ship as it began to boil. The SS Grand Count's hold and deck began to bulge as the pressure of the steam increased until shortly after 9 o'clock in the morning when the freighter exploded, exploded and the worst industrial accident in US history ensued. The entire dock complex was destroyed along with the nearby Monsanto chemical works, smaller industrial installations, and storage facilities. A tidal wave 
four meters high was created. A thousand buildings were destroyed. Every member of the local fire brigade was killed. The initial explosion also started a fire on another vessel, which was also carrying ammonium nitrate. This ship also exploded, adding to the mayhem, but only after it had been towed away from the original conflagration. One of that ship's propellers was found over a mile from the site of the second explosion. In total, in that incident, 5,000 people were injured and almost 600 died. Again, all as a result of the mismanagement of a simple, widely used and perhaps over-familiar inorganic chemical. Then, of course, in September 2001, a huge explosion ripped through the Azote de France fertilizer plant on the outskirts of Toulouse. This time, 30 people were killed, with more than 2,000 injured, 500 homes rendered uninhabitable, 85 schools and colleges were damaged, disrupting the education of 11,000 students. Secondary explosions shook adjacent chemical plants, and the wreckage was piled 10 meters high in some places. Again, an explosion in a storage facility, not a chemical process incident per se. In this case, ex experts still dispute the cause, with some citing an electrical failure and others chemical contamination with unstable nitrogen trichloride. Around 400 tons of off-spec ammodium nitrate was detonated, but things could have been much, much worse. The installation also carried a further 6,000 tons of ammonium nitrate, 30,000 tons of fertilizer, and up to 6,000 tons of liquid ammonia, rail wagons carrying chlorine, and the phosgene pipeline. But fortunately for the people of Toulouse, this inventory was not compromised by this explosion. And so we come to 2013, and last month, while I was attending ICAMI's second Hazards Asia-Pacific Symposium, news came in of the tragic incident which had occurred in West Texas. Ironically, the ASF's Global Safety Vice President, Hans Schwartz, had quite literally just given a keynote presentation in which he described those events in Oppo in 1921, when the story of West Texas broke. Of course, the full facts are still not clear, but there seems little doubt that ammonium nitrate is involved once again. What we do know is that 14 people died, 200 were injured when its explosive power was unleashed again. So the questions are, are there lessons that we should have learned, lessons that we should have passed on? Has corporate memory loss in any way played a part in this saga of incidents involving that same compound? On the basis of hazard alone, there are plenty of people who would argue that this substance should be banned. Even if you take a risk-based approach, that could lead you to that same conclusion based simply on the stark facts that I've presented here. But we, as engineers, know that that is not the whole story, because that very same inorganic compound brings life, prosperity, and human progress on a massive scale. And TCE is also a source of good news, not least via the series of features which it runs called Chemical Engineers Who Change the World. And it is truly impossible to recount the story of chemical engineering without a mention of Fritz Haber and Karl Bosch. This German pairing were responsible for the Haber process, arguably the most recognized chemical process in the world, capturing nitrogen from air and converting it to ammonia, largely for fertilizer production. Haber developed a high temperature, high pressure catalytic process to break the nitrogen triple bond. Bosch took care of the scale-up scale up and the process economics. 
and ammonia was first manufactured on an industrial scale in 1913. And the process is still used throughout the chemical process industries today, a century after its introduction. Given the impact of fertilizers on food production and consequently on nutrition, health, and population growth, those same challenges we face today. In 2011, Fritz Haber and Carl Bosch topped the TCE readers poll of chemical engineers who changed the world. So humankind's capability to fix nitrogen on an industrial scale is just one of many chemical processes that have made life markedly better for millions and millions of people. But the world at large generally doesn't know that. They hear about the bad stuff, but not the good stuff. And so even when it does hear about us, it's about the negative connotations associated with the word chemical, and sometimes with engineering too, because the negatives appear to them to outweigh the positive. In one US survey, when people were asked what came to mind when they heard the word chemical, the results are dominated by negative imagery with frequent associations with death, toxic, dangerous. And equally worrying are the findings of a Canadian survey in which a regular public response when prompted by the word risk was to say that means chemicals. We need to recognize that we and many of the industries we work in have a huge image problem. And there's a general lack of trust in us and what we do. Again, this is something that chemical engineering matters fully acknowledges. I think we also have to take some responsibility for that state of affairs and that negative image. Because we as engineers are really great at talking to one another we're pretty awful when it comes to conveying messages about our profession, about what we do, the benefits of our work, and how we manage risk to the public, to politicians, and to key influencers, including the media. There are some notable exceptions, of course. I'd like to think that I was one, but you can judge and trust and you can judge that for yourselves. But the fact remains that engineers who are good public communicators remain pretty unusual. I firmly believe that chemical engineering is a force for good. I wouldn't be stood here in front of you today if I didn't think that. Chemical process technology has delivered massive improvements in quality of life for many decades, and that work will continue in all parts of the world in the future. But it requires us to strive for greater public understanding, greater acceptance, and more support for what we do. ICME plans to work to secure public confidence in the profession and to tirelessly promote the message that chemical engineering matters. But we do need many more people, our members, to tell us about their success stories and their achievements so that we can deliver that goal. We all have to get better at communicating, not just with one another, but with others who will give us valuable feedback and insight, as well as being the recipients of our knowledge and our messages. One key thing we must do is to keep reminding ourselves that good communication is about listening as well as talking. And so, I'm sure for some of you, with some relief to my conclusion. Succeeding to the role of ICAMI president has given me a great platform from which to do many things. As the chair of HSE, I work across a broad range of industries today, which is an enormous privilege. And lately, I've been involved in a rather strange but important job of busting many myths around what health and safety is all about. But the interesting thing about wearing the iChemie's president's hat is that my focus will be sharpened and very much on the major process safety issues and the broader context 
into which that fits. So chemical engineering matters is the start of a new phase in iChemie's history. We're now in our 10th decade and the centenary year approaches rapidly. I am proud and I think we can all be proud of what the institution, our profession and the industries that we serve have achieved in the last century and indeed in this one. But we must also recognize the need to adapt and to change in today's fast-paced environment. ICME needs to work to use all of the knowledge that has accumulated since our foundation in 1922, only months after the explosion that devastated Oppo. We must nurture and we must preserve the vital lessons that have been learned through success and failure in the process industries. And we must ensure that we have the mechanisms to build upon, to share and to actively transfer our knowledge to the best advantage of our profession in pursuit of the public interest and even more importantly for the benefit of the next generation. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and honoured guests, I will make it my mission in my presidential year and thereafter to help prepare the next generation of engineers and leaders to deliver against chemical engineering matters. Thank you. Thank you, Judith, and rest assured that your trustees, your staff are fully engaged with the challenge that uh, Judith has, uh, has set out for us. Uh, the first task is to get the remainder of our 38,000 members